Well, so good to be with you guys this morning. If you uh, missed the first service when I forgot to even bring my mic up here to the front, so I'm hoping that's not a harbinger of things to come, that I will keep my mic on and remember other things. Good to be with you as always. I hope that uh, those of you who are fasting, who were here the last couple of weeks and who entered with us in the fast, that it was a rich time for you. Um, you know, some of you probably had some breakthroughs during the week. Others of you, perhaps like mine, that like me, that maybe not a breakthrough last week, but that you, uh, you know God heard and honored and saw the prayers and the fasting, and He's just going to wrap that up and take care of us. So, way to press in, church, way to press in. As we journey through 2 Timothy, I want to teach the Bible, but I also want to teach how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible. It's so vital that all of us as believers read the Bible and study the Bible for ourselves. You know, if this was just a book of theology, an academic book, it wouldn't be as important, but it's not. This is the living, breathing Word of God. Every word electric with the love and the power and the grace of God. And so we need ourselves to be digging in. And so that's part of my mindset in the back of my mind, especially as it's been so in 2 Timothy. A couple of weeks ago, I raised two principles about Bible reading. One is historical context. And by that, I simply mean that uh, whenever you take a book of the Bible like 2 Timothy, what are the historical circumstances of the writing? Who wrote it? What was the life situation? Who did he write it to? What was the purpose of it? That sort of thing. Second Timothy, for example, we know this is Paul's final letter, his farewell letter to his much-loved son in the faith, Timothy. And he's, he's, in many ways, passing off the baton because he could be executed at any time. And it turns out that he was. And so he's, uh, he's writing this final farewell charge to his son in the faith. We also talked a little bit about literary context. I know that's a little bit of an academic sounding word, literary context. And basically it means the flow of thought in a passage. If you come to a certain verse like uh, that you're trying to understand what this verse means, well, you always consider what's going on before it and what's going on afterwards. Literary context. It is said when it comes to Bible study, context is king. So two of those principles that we come to. This morning we're going to come to a third principle of Bible study. Actually, in the very last verse of the passage, which says this in verse 7. Um, I will be, in a few moments, I'll read the passage, 2 Timothy 1, 2, 1 through 7. So in verse 7, the last verse, it says this. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And when you consider that verse, we just leave it up there a few moments. He brings in two vital truths that are so germane to Bible study. Now, Paul had just given six verses to, to Tim. There's six. He said six verses in our... Okay, these verses were added about the 15th century. Um, they weren't there originally, the chapter divisions, the verse divisions. But in our terminology, he just had written these six verses, which would become a part of the Bible. And then he, he just pauses and gives us a principle of Bible study everywhere when he says, Timothy, Timothy, think about these things. Ponder, meditate, study, consider, think about them. And then he says, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So both study hard, God's going to teach you. Now, our tendency as believers is to lean hard to one side or the other rather than holding both truths in balance. Some of us, you know, maybe we might think, man, I'm really going to press into the study and the, and the pouring it over and learning and meditating but maybe we do so much uh, and, and we don't really depend upon the Spirit of God to enlighten our eyes, make it real in our hearts. Others of you might, might have the attitude, I don't need to dig in and study that hard because if God wants me to know it, He'll teach me it. Well, what God says in our Bible study is both and, not either or. Your, um, prayer, prayer does not make Bible study unnecessary. It makes it effective. It's going to help you understand. And so it's both and, digging in and depending upon the Lord. So that comes at the end of our study. All righty. So in our passage today, 1 through 7, we're going to see as Timothy turns a corner 
and uh, really challenges us. Would you stand with me, please? In honor of God's Word, and I'll read the first seven verses, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. All righty. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. This is God's holy word. Please be seated. All right. The very first verse, he says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace in Christ Jesus. And I've just got to be asking when I read those words, why does he say this at the start of this chapter? Why does Timothy, why does Paul tell Timothy, you then, my child, be strengthened in the grace? Real quickly, that was a fourth principle of Bible study. Ask questions of the text. That's how you really think about the text. You ask questions. You're asking questions all the time. That is Bible study in some ways. You just say, why did that happen? Why does he say this? What's the purpose here? When did that take place? Always we're asking questions of the text. When I read that, read that this week, I, my immediate question was, well, why does he say that? Well, you go to literary context and look at the, remind yourself of what happened in the previous few verses, and it's very clear because the previous few verses, he talked about two things. He talked about uh, that all those in Asia had deserted him, so so many deserted him. And so in contrast to that, he says, Timothy, you be strong in, 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 in the grace of Christ Jesus. They all defected. You be strong. You don't defect. And then, just after that, he had sa said, well, but there was an exception, a glorious exception, honest for us. He stood by me and strengthened me. And so again, he turns to Timothy, Timothy, you too be strong. And you don't w wimp out in the Christian life because of suffering. So when you look at the literary flow, it's clear why he says that. He says, Timothy, in contrast to all those others who de deserted me, and just like Anna who stood by me, you too be strong. You too, Timothy, be strengthened in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now note, note well that Paul does not command Timothy to be strong in himself or to be strengthened in himself. The Bible never tells us to be strong in our own strength. That would be like commanding a turtle to fly or a fish to, a fish to take wings. We cannot live the Christian life because we are strong in ourselves, because we grit our teeth and have determination. That doesn't work. If you've got a temper problem and you just really don't want to lose your temper again with your small, three small kids, it doesn't work to just say, okay, I'm really not going to do this again. But what God wants you to say, Lord, I cannot do this, but you can. Would you please give me grace? Would you please strengthen me? And, give me and that's just not true of moms of three preschoolers with temper problem. That's true of people struggling with lust with unforgiveness, with uh, self-centeredness, and on and on and on. Every, everything in the spiritual life must be done in the power of Christ's strength. Everything. And that is hard for we humans because we got a lot of pride, and I can do it myself. You know, we've had that since we were about one and a half. And so uh, it's hard for us, but we can humble ourselves. I cannot. God can. You too, Timothy, be strong, not, not in your strength, in the strength that is in Christ Jesus, in the grace in Christ Jesus. Now, in Ephesians 6.10, he says it even more emphatically when he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, I, I see three words for strength or power or might up there. Strong, strength, might. I mean, he's emphatic. You, you believers at Ephesus, be strong in the strength of his might. His power. The power of the whole Christian life is spent depending upon the power of God. And we've got to talk to ourselves about that all the time or we forget. At least I do. You 22 too. All righty. The classic biblical example 
of in our weakness being strong in Christ's strength is found by Paul's life himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He, he's wrestling with this big problem, and he keeps asking the Lord to deliver him, and, and God finally says, no, stop asking me. Now, in general, the principle of Scripture is this. If you've got a need, ask. Ask, ask, ask. Unless God makes it very clear to you, you're to stop asking. Ask until you die or until you get the answer that you want. But here, God tells Paul, stop asking, Timothy. I'm not going to do it. Uh, uh, God says to Paul, stop asking, Paul. So he doesn't tell us what the problem is, the weakness. Uh, he calls it a thorn in the flesh. Uh, some speculate, and there's some evidence that maybe it's a physical problem, maybe it's an eyesight problem, but we don't know. I think God left it general because all of our weaknesses, suffering, struggles, we can relate exactly because we all got them. They're our thorn in the flesh. Okay, let's see what he says about it. Verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In my weakness, I am strong in Christ. Now, uh, it's hard for proud human beings to take glory in our weakness, our suffering, our failure, our challenges. But that is when the power of God is to work in us, in our weakness, not in our strength. Yeah, you, you know, um, I love pastoring in an area like this with people like you. I just, y'all fit me. Oh, I was pastoring in Roseburg, Oregon. It just didn't fit. You know, God bless them, but that's where I need to be. Um, but you got a problem. Here's your problem. So many of you got so much money and gifts and education and resources that it's a little bit hard for you to, to recognize how much you need the power of God in your daily life. And unless you go through some big suffering, it's going to be really tough. Now, it didn't, you don't have to wait. Hopefully, you'll have enough godliness to recognize, hey, I may have a lot of money or I may have a lot of intelligence or I may have a lot of this, but I am absolutely slapdab dependent upon God for any good thing. But some of us need some extra help. 35 years, those of you who've been around with us, 35 years I'm struggling daily with mental torment from OCD, and, and I just wouldn't want anybody to go through that. And I'm so glad, cl thankful for the healing God brought beginning in May of, uh, of not to, uh, when I was 57, May of 20, 2011. But um, God used that so much in my life to teach me my weakness and my absolute dependence, desperateness you got some weakness in your life. It may not be mental anguish that you barely are surviving, but it's something. And, and in that weakness, be strong in Christ's strength. Not your own, but Christ's power for everything in the Christian life and for all the Christian life. Timothy, be strong in the strength that is in Christ Jesus. In verse 2, he says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will in turn teach others also. Now, there are, there are four generations that he talks about here. It starts with him, Paul. In fact, we got a little graphic on this. It starts with Paul. The things which you have heard from me, Timothy, and the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who in turn will teach others also. So these generation to generation, generation, generation. Now that has application to every believer. And that single verse right there is probably the most famous discipleship verse in the New Testament. And, and I'll come back to us for a minute. But, but it did have special rel relevance to Paul and Timothy because Paul is dying. He's the chief apostle. Timothy is his main apostolic legate. He's pastoring the church he started in Ephesus. And he's saying, Timothy, carry the baton. Pass on the torch. Don't let it flag. The things which you have heard from me in the scriptures, his own teaching about Jesus, the, what you have heard from me, you've got to pass these on to other men who in turn will pass it on to other people, who in turn will pass it on to other people, and right down the line, to, including you and me. Now, we're, we're maybe about, about a billion down that line, but we're in the legacy that began with Paul. 
and was passed on to Timothy and passed on to the faithful men who could teach others. So special relevance to Paul and Timothy, but general relevance to every believer because God wants all of us to invest in others, to mentor others, to disciple others, to pour into others what God has poured into us. And so who is God speaking to us to pour into? Well, if you've got children at home, of course, they're the obvious ones, but they're probably not the only ones. That's more your role than your ministry. Your role is a father or mother, but you probably also have a ministry. But it's certainly going to start with your kids if you've got kids at home. But maybe a friend comes to Christ. Maybe one of your top five comes to Christ. Maybe you have a group of children in our children's ministry during the, another service, and, and you're pouring into them. Or, or maybe in our student ministry. Maybe in your community group. Um, Maybe uh, God just puts somebody in your heart and you, and you approach them. We, we, we may not be pastors like Paul was, like Timothy was, like I am, but all of us are called to disciple other people. And that includes reaching lost people for Christ, helping believers grow in Christ. And nobody sits on the sidelines when it comes to that. For example, consider what Paul said in Titus 2.3 when he said, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior and slanderers are slaves to much wine. Not slanderers are slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the younger women to love their husbands and children. And, and the perspective in the body of Christ, this cross-generational, multi-generational body is that, is that older women teach younger women. Yeah, older men teach younger men. So those of you who are older uh, this morning, older men and older women, I'll let you define if you're in that category or not, uh, but I am, a uh, special charge to you because, you know, for a long time, I felt like every man under 40, just about every man under 40 at Wood's Edge needs a father, a and they're all over, and we need our older men and older women stepping up, and this is what Say is going to say to you, who are you to do that? You don't know enough. Uh, you're not godly enough. Uh, not about you. It's about passing on about the Lord. And, and you don't sit down and give a sermon. You'll never do that. But just informally, you'll invest in people. You'll love them. You'll pray for them. You'll spend time with them. Maybe you'll memorize some verses together. Maybe you'll read a Christian book together. Maybe you'll go through a, a, a book of the Bible together. But you'll just talk and encourage them, and you'll be passing on what God's passed on to you. And that's how the Christian life works. Life on life. This, yesterday, I, I get this email from a guy in our church, older man in our church. And he, what did he say? He said, uh, uh, he, he was in a discipleship group of mine a couple of years ago. And, and, and this year, he's pouring into several guys, so doing some of the same things that I did with him. And, and then he, he, he's writing an email to six more for next year. And, and, and he said, you know, he's challenging them to, to, to join him in this journey. And he says, this is how Houston will become a city of God. It won't be by big mass crusades. It'll be life on life all over this city, neighborhood by neighborhood. And you can be a part of it. You need to be a part of it. God has caused you to be. All right, we've seen two big challenges from God to us. One, be strong in Christ's strength for everything that's rich in life. Secondly, um, the second one is to pass on, invest in others, disciple others what God has taught you. At this point, have a little bit of an unusual stretch in his writings in that he gives us three pictures in a row of what it means to be a, a follower of Jesus Christ. Three portraits. One's going to be a soldier, one's going to be an athlete, and one's going to be a farmer. And there's something he's saying to us all together and in each one. In fact, for the soldier, he'll have two specific points to make, then the athlete and the farmer, one each. But just, you, you put them all together, and he's saying something very concrete about the spiritual life to us. Let's look at it. Verse 3, he says, Share in suffering as a, good, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Suffering is inherent for a soldier. The same way suffering is inherent for the Christian, the Christ follower. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 8, Tim, Paul used almost the same words to Timothy. So this is the second time. And our verse, verse 3, he says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And, but earlier in chapter 1, verse 8, he said, share in suffering, same exact words, for the gospel by the power of God. Always by the power of God. Always. There is suffering as part of 
all life on this planet, a fallen, broken world. We're not in heaven yet. And certainly those who are serious about Jesus Christ. And in fact, in the Roman Empire, depending on who was emperor at the time, there would be more or less persecution. At times, certain emperors, man, they would just, you know, go after the Christians. But they were in the Colosseums, they were getting killed, and it was bad. And that, uh, under Nero, where we're writing now, it's pretty bad. Paul is in a dungeon, and he's going to get executed. It could happen to Timothy. He says, Timothy, you do not shrink back from serving Jesus Christ. Don't play it safe. I'm not going to say be foolish, but you walk with God. You do not be ashamed of the gospel. You stand up. You share in the suffering. I'm reading a book now on World War II. Uh, Andrew Roberts, Storm at War, maybe the best single-volume history of World War II. And believe me, those soldiers suffered so much. And that is true of the Christian life. If you are a follower of Christ going all out, there will be suffering involved. Sometimes it can be persecution. In our country, it might be more verbal or relational or social. Many parts of the world, it might mean arrest or beatings or torture or even death. But there's just going to be suffering in general. For example, you know, we, we, we don't live for ourselves. We live for Christ, and that changes everything. We, we are not surprised if there's suffering because... Um, that's just part of the Christian life. We don't live for ourselves. We live for another. We live for our neighbors. We live for other people. We are in the midst of a raging spiritual battle. And yes, there is suffering if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Share in it. Now, in the next verse, he, he's still going to stay on soldiers but make a different point when he says in verse 4, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So the first point, suffer like a soldier. The second point, don't get entangled in other things. Be single-minded to please your commander. Now, it's pretty simple. Probably if you're in a battlefield somewhere, you know, just do what your commander says. You know, sometimes we make the Christian life pretty difficult, and there are some nuances to it. But in many ways, it's simple. Obey the Lord. Please the Lord. Live for the Lord. And let other things fall where they may. There's a lot of freedom in this because you as a human are like me. You struggle with pleasing people, wanting to please people. you got to please your mom and please your dad. You know, they might be, have been dead 20 years, but you're still trying to please them. you got to please your boss and your spouse and everybody else around you. Um, the gospel says, oh, no, you don't have to please anybody. Just Jesus. Just Jesus. That, that's, that's, we got one person audience. Just please your commanding officer. And there's great freedom in that. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul kind of summarized the Christian life when he says, So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. One person, audience, the Lord, seeks to please Him. Okay, he's had two aspects of the soldier, suffering and single-minded pleasing. Now the athlete, he says in verse 5, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Now, Paul could say a lot of things about athletes, and in fact, Paul, maybe three, four, five times, uses athletic imagery. I kind of like it that he was a sports guy. But uh, here, he's making one point about athletes, not their discipline, not their hard work, not their all-out effort in the race, not their training, but this. you got to compete according to the rules if you want the crown. Um, when I was a, a, a young marathoner, kind of a professional marathoner, in 1980, uh, a lot of the elite runners in the United States, we, we didn't run the Boston Marathon that year because the, the Olympic Trials Marathon was about a month later, and you couldn't do both. So a lot of us were watching it on television, and uh, we were aghast to see that the, the, the first place woman, well, she didn't look like a runner, she didn't dress like a runner, she didn't run like a runner, she, she you know, just, and we, we'd never heard of her. Who, who was Rosie Ruiz? And, and it turns out that... Uh, the winner of the Boston Marathon in 1980, the, the, the woman winner, Rosie Ruiz, this is what she did. She takes a taxi to mile 24 and makes sure that the, the top woman is far enough back so he, she can run the last two miles and come across as the top woman runner. And, uh, you know, they didn't discover that for a while. For a while, they're thinking they just, uh, we were all baffled. You don't win <laughs> The crown, unless you compete according to the rules. All righty. God is saying something. It's pretty basic here in the Christian life. You got rules. 
the Bible. You don't win the prize unless you obey what the Lord has to say. You, you love your neighbor as yourself. You, you, you love God, not money. You tell the truth always. You, you, give, you forgive people just as God has forgiven you, and on and on and on. Now, the good thing about this is that these aren't arbitrary things. These are for our life. I mean, th- this is the fuel we run on. This is, obedience to God is our liberation and freedom. But we compete according to the rules. We've got a commanding officer, and we follow him. Okay, final metaphor is this, verse 6. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Now, at one point in American history, you know, most of us would have been spent time on a farm. Probably very few of you have spent much time, but we all get the picture. Farmer's got to get up early. He's got to work hard and get the crops in and get the crops, you know, the seeds out and all that stuff. And they work hard. In the same way, God says, expect hard work in the Christian life. Expect it to be hard. How's it hard? It's not hard physically so much. That's not the the main point. But just in your heart, in your attitude, in your spirit. You live your whole life for another. You take time to pray and meet God in His Word every day. Because He's the most important thing in the world to you. You, throughout the day, you say no to sin. No to temptation to sin. And even no to things that are bad for you. You know, a non-Christian neighbor wouldn't have to think about, you know, they want to sit on the couch and watch Netflix all day, do it. But, but we are accountable to the Lord. And so we don't want to overdose on anything that would not be good for you, whether or not that's Facebook, Instagram, your hobby, television, whatever. So even things that are not good for us, we want to please the Lord and be as effective for Him in every part of our life. We, we want to spend our whole life not following our dreams and agendas, but the Lord's dreams and agendas. And so we have this mindset, this spirit, that, you know, it's not easy always. It's a fight at times. We need to fight that fight. Now, when you think about those three pictures together, I mean, clearly there is this sense, suffering, Uh, discipline, obedience, single-minded pursuit, hard work. You don't go to glory on a bed of roses. Don't expect to. God has not called you to a life of ease, comfort, convenience, and luxury. Don't expect it to be that way. Now, church, if you adopt this mindset, you will be unusual here in the United States church. Suburban, affluent, America, you will be unusual because it's all around you <laughs> is the opposite mindset. Now, if you were living in China, you're part of the underground church in China, every time you met, you could be arrested, you probably have that mindset. So here's the challenge. Wherever you're living, including in affluent America, will you adopt the Christ-centered, Christ-glorifying, self-denying mindset to live for Christ and not yourself? You know, Jesus says something very similar in Luke 9, 23, when he says, you want to come after me, you, you deny yourself, and you take up your cross, and you follow me. It's not always going to be easy. I am not calling us to be workaholics or uh, never have any relaxation or take a Sabbath, things like that. That's not my point. I'm talking about we're going to obey the Lord, and we're going to live for the Lord no matter what it costs us. If we have at least 10% more income, uh, money to spend than people around us, no problem. It's our privilege to give the first 10% to God. If we have less time to spend than others around us because we are going to take time along with God in the Word and prayer, no problem. Whatever He calls us to, it is our privilege because He died for us. You know, it was, it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, martyred right before the end of World War II by Hitler. He said, when Christ calls a man, He bids him come and die. Self-denial. Not the most popular message in the U.S. culture today. During World War II, the people in Britain who were citizens there, they had a lot of restrictions on themselves, uh, on them about rations and what they could eat, what they could do, lights, they had all kind of restrictions. And this is how they would encourage one another with those restrictions. They'd say, there's a war on. Oh yeah, I've got to 
can't eat butter this month. There's a war on. There's a war on. Everything is different because there's a war on. Now, World War II was the most, um, the biggest historical time in our, in our world, except for the events of the Gospels. I mean, the life change, the suffering, the heroism, uh, the stakes were so big. But what you are living in is far bigger than World War II because you are living in a cosmic spiritual war raging across the universe. And there are, got, there are demons flinging themselves to attack you and your loved ones. And we will not go to heaven on a bed of roses. You do not do your life on a cruise ship, but a battleship. You will spend your entire life in spiritual war, in spiritual battle, and, that, and, and, and hopefully at the end of your life you can say what Paul could say, I fought the good fight. I fought the good fight. The Christian life is not ease and comfort and living for yourself. It is all out surrender to Jesus Christ no matter what that means. And that is so emphatic in 2 Timothy. As Paul is charging Timothy and it's so emphatic, so important for us in our lives. You know, this speaks directly to retirement. So many of you are my age and you've retired. Great, I'm going to retire one day. I'm not against retirement. But we never have a retirement mentality. It's great if you can stop working at your paid job. You've got more time for grandkids and golf or whatever. Great. But you never have a retirement mentality if you're a believer. You've got a wartime mentality. A wartime mentality. I am here on this planet to seek the Lord, love the Lord, and to love other people. Whatever he calls me to do, it is my privilege. There's a war on. After saying all of that, Paul exhorts Timothy, Timothy, think about these things because God will give you understanding in everything. Nearly 50 years ago, I was a freshman at Rice University and a new Christian. Someone gave me a book by a British writer J.I. Packer, and it's called Knowing God. It, be, it has become my favorite book. I think I've read it ten times. I'll read it some more. In that book, he included a quote by a 19th century bish, Anglican bishop by the name of J.C. Ryle. When I read this quote, it stirred me deeply, and I go back to it from time to time. This week, I'm reading this passage. I'm studying this passage in my study, and this, this quote leapt to my mind. Now I want to read it to you. And I want you to ask yourself, is this my heart? Do, do I want God to give me this kind of heart? Here's the quote. Zeal in religion is a burning desire to please God, to do His will, and to advance His glory in the world in every possible way. It is a desire which no man feels by nature, which the Spirit puts in the heart of every believer when he is converted, but which some believers feel so much more strongly than others that they alone deserve to be called zealous men. A zealous man in religion is preeminently a man of one thing. It is not enough that he is earnest, hearty, uncompromising, thoroughgoing, wholehearted, fervent in spirit. He only sees one thing. He cares for one thing. He lives for one thing. He is swallowed up in one thing. And that one thing is to please the Lord. Whether he lives or whether he dies, whether he has health or whether he has sickness, whether he is rich or whether he is poor, whether he pleases man or whether he gives offense, whether he is thought wise or whether he is thought foolish, whether he gets blame or whether he gets praise, whether he gets honor or whether he gets shame, for all this, the zealous man cares nothing at all. He burns for one thing. And that one thing is to please God and to advance His glory. Does that quote stir your heart too? Does that do anything in your heart that 
Jesus Christ is worthy of that kind of life for me. If Jesus be God and died on a bloody cross for me, he is worth my entire life. It's just too sad I don't have a thousand lives to live for him. This is the only one. Don't waste it. Dear church, don't waste your one life. Live it for him. Stand with me. Give us grace, Lord. Some people may have this more than others, Lord God, but would you please give us grace to hunger for you, to love you, to serve you? Give us this kind of zeal for you. Friend, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, do so now. Breathe a prayer. Jesus, I need a Savior. I need a Savior. Lord, give us wisdom, what this might mean. And give us strength, your strength, to fulfill it. Bless these, your people, in Christ's name.